let me tell you what happened. Like that is the number one thing that will help. I honestly think that becoming an entrepreneur so early in my career was a mistake. I hope they listen to this. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, or wherever you find yourself <coughs> listening to this podcast. Welcome to our podcast series, which is all about offering insights, strategies, and stories to help uh, independent talent navigate their professional as well as personal journeys. Um, joining us today is Azim Zainulbhai, who is the co-founder and also the CPO of Outsized. Welcome, Azim. Thank How you, are you very much. Great. Happy to be here. Yeah. So we are shooting our first podcast series. How are you feeling about the first episode? Uh, I am feeling very scared, very frustrated, and I would like this to end quickly. Okay. So we'll, <laughs> but I'm feeling good. <laughs> so let's we'll get started with our first question, um, which is about, you've co-founded a lot of companies till, till date, and you've stuck with Outsides for pretty long, and how has your entrepreneurial journey been till now? Yeah, that's an interesting one, because when you look back on the past, um, it's easy to make, it's easy to identify patterns that when you are going through the journey, you don't see. So like the decision that I made at the time to leave finance and become an entrepreneur, I can look back and attribute certain things to it because of other things that have happened later and the decisions that I've made later. But like in the moment, it becomes very tough to see. And as you progress and as I progressed in my career, I've been able to, I would say, align more towards actually taking a decision for a reason that I can look back and say, that's why I did it. And, and you'll see that, you know, in my career, I was a banker and a private equity professional before I became an entrepreneur. And then as an entrepreneur, I was an everything entrepreneur. Hey, I can do anything anywhere and have confidence myself to, you know, coming to outsize and actually being very specific about what I wanted to focus on. The pattern that, that, played out in my career is going from being specific to being a generalist to going back and being specific. And when I look back and, and look at those transition points and try to figure out why I did what I did, um, there's a very different set of reasons that I can attribute versus what happened in reality in the first transition, which was going from finance to becoming an entrepreneur. And then in the second transition from going from being a generalist entrepreneur to saying, hey, I am going to focus on a very specific area. So at the beginning, when I made the first transition, it was, I would say, you know, at the time, a little bit of hubris. Hey, I'm a smart guy. I can do whatever, you know, like, let me just go and do it. And I have the capability and, and you know, the will and the ability um, and that's what drove me. But when I look past, when I look into the past and, and try to identify a pattern, um, what, what I do see is, is that finance as a very specific area was something that I wasn't getting enough out of, right? I wanted more, not just like more money or anything, but I wanted more of a challenge. And it was a mistake. I, could, I honestly think that becoming an entrepreneur so early in my career was a mistake because there was a lot more I could have done within finance and, and within the depth L2, L3 of finance that would have helped me later in my career that I'm learning now. Later in my career, after becoming an entrepreneur, a failed entrepreneur a couple of times, then joining a, a team of other entrepreneurs that hopefully were going to succeed this time, what I realized is that you have to put in a lot of time and effort into something that's much more specific to be able to gain the benefits across a generalist kind of platform. So like your generalist skill area. And that's why I chose product because in product, as you go deeper and deeper into L1, L2, L3, L4, the lessons that you learn, the frameworks that you learn, the, um, the skills that you learn, even if they are specific to product in some cases or specific to engineering in some cases, the thought and the mindset about how you approach every single other aspect of the business become transferable. So that's part of my journey and the patterns that I've learned. Okay. And now that you are the chief product officer of Outsized, um, how has that journey been like? Like what skills did you learn and where are you now currently? Yeah. 
So again, I mean, identifying a pattern versus reality. Let me tell you what happened. There are four co-founders of Outsized, and one day in 2019, we were sitting around a table, and we said, man, you know what? The future of this business is product. Does anyone have product experience? No. <laughs> hey, Azim, didn't you like work for this company, housing.com? They had a great product, right? Yeah, but dude, I was the CFO. I was not a product guy. Hey, everybody who wants Azim to be the product guy, raise their hand. And I didn't have my hand up, but I was outvoted, and that's how I became product. That's a, that's a real story of how I got into product. Okay. Now, it was lucky because I love it. Um, but how has my journey been? In 2019, when I started doing it, you know, yeah, of course I went and I read a bunch. I talked to a bunch of people, tried to understand how to do product right. I did it wrong. And I mean, I already uh, still, even three, four years later, I'm, I, I can look back and, and see the products that I built and be like, my God, they are shit, right? Um, however, it did well enough that we were able to, you know, continue to build this business. And, and over time, what I've learned is that it takes a lot of patience, a lot of repeated effort, a lot of daily learning, a lot of daily effort, and, you know, also a lot of doing shitty things and learning from your mistakes to actually get better um, at product. And in, in going through that journey, but in putting myself in a place where I have to do it day in and day out for an elongated period of time, I feel like I've learned a lot. Now, I'm not even close to the end of my product journey. Like, I'm still a shitty product manager. The good thing is that, you know, after raising a Series A, I've hired people who know how to do it better. But luckily from them, I'm, I'm still learning a lot. Okay, so you've mentioned failure twice. One is when you just started your entrepreneurial journey and now as a CPO where you've, all, where you've seen um, things fail and then you set it back up. How have you dealt with failure and what is your immediate reaction to something that's not working out in your favor? Oh, that is a very good question, actually. So I keep a lot of notes um, and I have this little hashtag in my notes called cortisol. Okay. And every time something happens that sucks or where I get into a fight with, you know, like when I get into a fight with some of the other co-founders about product or about anything or with you even, Tanya, you know, I make a note of it. I say hashtag cortisol. And so I, I, I go through every year these cortisol moments in every couple of months just to see like, am I making progress against understanding like why that happened, why that failure happened. Cortisol is just another word for failure. Like I got stressed out about something, likely because I knew something was wrong and I didn't want to acknowledge it. Um, and I think I've made a lot of progress by um, doing, and this is really a product thing, because in product, people criticize your product all the time. I mean, like a good outcome is, no, is somebody saying nothing, but there's never like, oh, great job. Wow, amazing. Like in other parts of the business, you sell, right? You, you, you book a lot of revenue for the company. You're like, oh my God, amazing. You know, you roll out a new product and if people say nothing, that's an amazing outcome. But usually people are going to say things like, are you fucking kidding me, Azim? This is misspelled. How can I trust the product if this one word is misspelled, right? But you get, you get lots of other feedback and one of the things that you really learn how to do is to take that feedback. And so slowly over the course of the last couple of years, I've reduced the amount of cortisol in my system when people give me feedback. And I do things like smile and ask them why. Even in, though in my head, I mean, I'm still thinking like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? I'm still, you know, at least outward, a lot more calm. And it has helped inward too, you know, and it also helps me get more feedback to be able to actually do what I want to do because the ultimate outcome is to be able to build a great product. And to do that, you need feedback, right? So I think that's one way I've dealt with it. Um, you know, talking about how people normally have no reaction or they come, come to you with really negative feedback. One thing I've noticed is if they don't understand what you're actually doing and what's the back-end work going behind it, uh, it's going to be very easy to come and say, yeah, yeah this is pretty shitty. Yeah. You could have done a better job. Like I find it even in marketing, I know the amount of effort that's gone into say a video or a creative and somebody comes in and it's like, I hate it. Like, this is shit. This is yeah. horrible. Yeah. So yeah, si similar yeah. experience for me as well. But you have to keep two things in mind. Number one is the ultimate goal of what you're trying to do. Like, hey, I want to make this amazing. 
Like I, as the individual who's creating, I want to make this amazing. I want to create an awesome outcome. So you have to keep that in mind. And the second thing you have to keep in mind is you have to help the other person understand what the vision is. Hmm. So, hey, V1 of a product is never going to be perfect. But are, but does somebody understand what you're trying to, where you're trying to go towards, what you're trying to get to? Right? In fact, I'm going to have a conversation with Anurag today about a new product that we're launching called Virtual Bench, where in V1, we're not going to roll out all of the bells and whistles with dashboards and da-da-da that, that need to happen. No, but what am I going to do? I'm going to be able to roll out a product that gets him what he needs, which is SQL, sales qualified leads, right? Um, and, and as long as you can frame things in a way that people understand, then you'll be more, less likely to have cortisol, more likely to get them on your side. Okay, but also when it comes to taking feedback, there's obviously going to be um, certain principles that you stand by and there's external feedback. How do you filter, okay, this is actually going to make my product better uh, and feedback that's just like, yeah, you probably don't know the mindset or the thought process behind this decision. We face this every day, all the time. Yeah. Um, because, so I'll give you an example. What we do is we have a program to go out and get user interviews done. Right, And a user interview can be gen a general interview about our service, or it can be specific about a specific product or like a, a set of screens about a product that we're going to roll out. And we're not expecting the user to come back to us with like tangible feedback of, hey, I'm gonna, I think the solution should be X. Right? And our job is to take all of that feedback to be able to categorize it, prioritize it, identify patterns in it, and then take a call. But the tough part, that, that has, the thing that has been the toughest for me is, I used to think that we need to address every single piece of feedback, right? A lot of times, no, you, you just can't because mm. it doesn't align with the goals or the principles that you have. And you just need to make sure that the other person feels listened to. And especially when it's internal, like your boss saying, I don't want to do it this way. You make sure that, the, that they feel listened to. You make sure to tell them what your point of view is. You let it sit for a bit so that both you and that person can kind of cool down, right? And then you come back later with an actual understanding and take a call of what you're going to do. I took this decision because I believe in this. Fine. Right? At the end of the day, a week later, it's not going to matter as much to the person as it is in the moment. So those are the ways that I, uh, that I kind of address it. But... I mean, there's so much more, right? You, you, you can only learn to be calm over time and everybody has their own strategies and dealing with different people can be, you know, you can have vastly different outcomes or vastly different, different strategies. Okay. So pivoting back to our uh, topic, which is about entrepreneurship, throughout your career, you've successfully led teams and you've also raised significant funding for various projects. Um, what strategies did you find most effective in stakeholder management and investor relations? Well, going back to my journey, I thought I knew, like I had the hubris to think I knew everything. And then when I joined Outsized, I very quickly ultimately went the opposite direction, which is the I know nothing. Like I know enough to know that I don't know anything. And now I'm finally starting to come back up the curve saying, you know what, there are certain things that I'm pretty good at, you know, um, but I'm good at them because I can now say, let me, let me take you through the frameworks that work for me in that. Whereas before there would be no framework, it would just be gut feel. Now there's like a framework that drives everything. Um, so what are strategies that I use for effective stakeholder management? Um, Look, some of these are general, some of these are specific, but they work for me. Um, number one is I always try to be an active listener. And to be an active listener, it means to pause and to restate when somebody tells you something. People feel a lot more listened to when you do that, even if you don't necessarily believe what they're saying. When you can restate it to them, they know that you've heard them, right? And that's really important. Um, I've seen it being overdone, though. So I have a colleague uh, at Outsized who I hope watches this, who tends to do this way too much, who will pause every like 15 seconds, be like, wait a second, is this what you said? I'll be like, dude, like do it maybe every two to five minutes or something, maybe not every 30 seconds. Nick, that's you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, the, the second thing that has worked for me is I take 
while I take a lot of notes, there, there's a strategy um, that I discovered maybe 10 years ago that I call hashtag 30 second. And the hashtag 30 second is after every meeting or after every activity, I will write one sentence about that activity right away. It doesn't necessarily need to be the, the, the actual summary of what we did, but it is like the one key takeaway or the next task that I need to or whatever. But that's like almost like a, putting a flag in the ground in my head about that, that when I refer back to it, it gives me like a launching off point to do. And that's been really helpful because that means I forget less stuff. Um, and the most important thing that that helps me to do from a stakeholder management perspective is when you're trying to build relationships, it's, okay, when I go back and I meet somebody the second time, I can then go refer to my notes beforehand and be like, oh yeah, you know, like he, Amneet just had a kid or something. I mean, obviously I would know Amneet just had a kid because Amneet's part of our team, but let's say this is an external, you know, external stakeholder, right? Like, oh, that person just had a kid three months ago and that's when I met him. Hey, how's your baby doing? You know, that kind of thing so that you can build a personal relationship. And it can't just be like bullshit. Like you have to care. Um, but these are things that have helped me to manage stakeholders. I think the over, while these are like tactics, the overarching thing that, has helped me is to always be prepared before I go into any, like I'm thinking a board meeting or a co-founder meeting or something like that. It's like, you got to prepare. Just like I was talking about for this podcast, I don't like to do it like off the cuff. I'd rather come in and have thought about the questions before and, and put my bullet points down and be prepared. That has helped immensely. Like that is the number one thing that will help is to go in and say, even if a meeting is one hour long and you're doing the meeting, spend an hour before the meeting prepping for that meeting. It sounds so dumb. Most people won't do it, but it makes a huge difference. And you follow the same uh, pattern with investor relations as well? Yeah, before you go to a, a fundraising meeting, for sure. I mean, th that's like, that's cr th this is typical sales. So you go to a fundraising meeting, you go to a, a, client, a new client pitch, um, you talk to Anurag about the same thing. We will be prepping for that meeting, right? We have a series of things that we know that we need to know about it. So for fundraising, it would be like, how do we know the investor? What, what, um, you know, what sectors does that specific partner at that firm invest in? What does the firm invest in? Do they have any, you know, adjacent companies that they've invested in? What's their ticket size? What's their blah, 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 blah. Go check the news. What's their most recent deal, et cetera. Okay. And, um, so talking about fundraise, outsides just raised its Series A funding last year. Um, I want to know what was the most challenging part about this fundraise. Okay, let's talk about outsides, but also you've been part of other startups. If they have varied experiences, I want you to elaborate on that. In prior fundraises, my problem has been not being prepared. Okay. Right, not going into that L2, L3, L4 level of depth. Well, L2 always, but L3, L4 level of depth. Do you want to elaborate what L2, L3 is for people who don't understand it? L1 is like knowing the story, right? Like, hey, I can tell you a story without numbers or anything, just what the big idea is. L2 is the, the sub points of the big idea. So in our case, it would be talking in depth about the client and the talent instead of just the marketplace in general. L3 would be talking about the data behind it. How many people? Why? What's the market size, etc. And L4 would be the nuances behind all of that, right? So that in this specific case, that's what I mean, but it just, it's really just a way for me to say, you have to go one level deeper. I may only tell you the three bullet, three bullet points. So when you, when somebody watches this, they'll say there's three bullet points there. However, in the notes, there will be nine. Mm. There will be three bullet points or 12, three bullet points below each of the three bullet points, right? Is that nine, three plus no, it would be 12, right? <laughs> Okay, now coming back to the most challenging moment for outsides, for the outsides funders. Okay, I, I, there's two. One challenging point is just the length of time it took, right? So from when we started to when we finally closed, over 12 months, right? Um, and even longer if, if I'm being more conservative, right? When we started thinking about it versus when we went out to market. Um, it was just challenging to be able to to be able to do that. Luckily, we were cash flow neutral at the time, so it was fine. Like we could 
afford to do that. But it was still annoying because it meant that I had to spend a significant amount of time focusing on that instead of on the product. And that has impacts on the product or in, in our other co-founders' cases on the, on the business, right? We could have sold a hell of a lot more had the fundraise not taken so long. And there's nothing we could have done to make it go faster, to be honest, right? It was a bad market at the time, um, and sometimes things are just luck, right? Um, we, we, in fact, got very lucky with, our, um, you know, with the investors that we found. <laughs> I hope they listen to this. <laughs> um, in terms of the hardest part, the second hardest part, but it was a part that I actually enjoyed, um, was the negotiation. And that was because um, when we were negotiating with our investors, it allowed me to put into practice some of the skills that I'd been learning in product, right? Going deeper, understanding the issues at the table, asking the right questions. I'd done these negotiations before, but now with that product lens on, I was not afraid to go deeper and to ask more questions. And I mean, I also threw a little bit of fun into the, into the process by writing really funny things to our investors in the negotiated documents to see if they would catch it, like little Easter eggs. Um, you know what I'm talking about, Jonathan, right? Um, so I think for me, while it was hard, it was also a lot of fun because it allowed me to actually put to use these skills and do it successfully, ultimately. Now, if it wasn't successful, then we'd probably be having a different conversation, but um, or no conversation at all. But, um, but I think that was challenging and rewarding. So during the whole process, what was the one thing that you kept telling yourself to, to keep at it? Because 12 months is a very long time. Oh, that's easy. I mean, we, we've always believed in kind of the mission and vision of Outsized and what we can actually accomplish. I mean, this is a very, you should probably do a podcast with Anurag about that because he can explain that really well. Like, what do we at Outsize stand for? Mm. And so when you take a step back, even though this process is long and annoying and whatever, right, you can take a step back and be like, but I know why I'm doing it, right? I have this goal, this idea, and that can power you through the, the darkness. Okay. And what advice would you give people who are just foraying into entrepreneurship or people who have already been and have not been successful at it yet? It's, I would say it's more of a, a, of, a, of a general piece of career advice, which is go specific first instead of going generalist. So even as an entrepreneur, but I would say like, hey, better to be an entrepreneur later in life than earlier and have gone through and actually built a competence in something because that process of building competence, whatever, it could be finance, it could be, you know, it could be operations, it could be sales, but that as you grow and you build comp competence in one skill, you end up learning a lot about the frameworks and the structures behind it, and you understand what depth and competence looks like. And once you do that, then trying to build it in something else becomes a lot easier than never having it at all. So like I, I can look back at my career and say, I did not have competence in finance. I have way more competence in finance today than I did when I was a banker, believe it or not, right? Um, and I wish I had stuck it out for longer so that I had developed that confidence earlier on so that I wouldn't have made mistakes that I made in my career as an entrepreneur, um, you know, later. But do you regret those mistakes? I don't think you do because otherwise what's the, what's the learning curve? Oh, of course I regret the mistakes, man. I, all the time I think about things like, man, if I could have gone back, I would have been so much better. You know, it would have been so awesome. Anything. No, but that's for anything. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love that exercise. I don't, I don't shy away from that exercise. I'm not like, oh man, I wish I could have done that. Like this sucks. Okay. It's like, man, like, look at how awesome I am now. Imagine how much more awesome I could have been. <laughs> don't keep that in. <laughs> I will have this in. Um, so looking back, what would you say was a pivotal moment in your career that set you on your current path today? I think outsized, I had to take a call when I joined Outsized, and it was a very specific call, which was at that point in my career, I was I had moved around every two years for a long time. It was like maximum amount of time I spent at one place was two years, and I was like, I 
to develop the competence that I want to, and the skill and the, and the ability and the attention to detail and the L4 level of depth, I need to go to a place where I will park myself for a long time. And I need to surround myself by people that I know will drive me to be better. And so that's, I mean, that's really the story of outsides, right? Nicholas, Anurag, uh, Johan, and I, when we came together, it was very clear that these are the types of people that will push me, that will force me to be better every day. But the bet that I was taking is that be, they'd be patient enough to allow me to learn to get there, right? Um, and, and that's been, I mean, it's been awesome. It's also been frustrating, right? Like each of the four of us has different competences and we've all grown, but I still know like Anurag is going to point out my weakness in certain areas where I'm still growing, right? But that's great because even, you know, even though it's frustrating, it means that I am getting a lot better, right? At, at some of those areas. And so that was the real call of outsize. That was, hey, you know, obviously do I think, do I, does the original idea of outsize resonate with me, with me? Yes. But then am I going to be around people that will allow me to develop mastery? So there's this concept of like, I've said competence a couple of times, but I think it's really about developing mastery because developing mastery is, is saying, I am, I am good enough at something that it doesn't seem like work anymore. Like that's where I want to be, where I'm so good at something that it's like, it's like art, you mm -hmm. know? I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm still developing mastery, right? But I would love to be a master at a skill. So how important do you think having such supportive co-founders played a role in your in your journey a huge amount and I do you mean, think it's important for other entrepreneurs to have it as well it's more about the kind of support or the challenge that you get and and in terms of personality i think it for me it worked like i knew at this stage in life this is what i needed and what i wanted i it's it's a it's not something that i can easily pattern out to other people what i can pattern out um, to other entrepreneurs is to say you need to build a support system that is not support for the bad times, but is the support of people who will challenge your ideas, right? Annoyingly sometimes, but we'll do that because it forces you to think better. Any closing thoughts that you have? No. Before we wrap it up. I'm good. Okay, thank you so much, Azim. I think this is a great podcast, even for me, if I ever want to fall into entrepreneurship, I know like a few things I have to have in my checklist. So thank you very much. You're welcome.